we just did was uh, the really fun part. Uh, everything sounds great. God's big. He's good. Um, if God's so good and God's so great and God's so kind and God's so generous and God's so loving, uh, why is everything so messed up? This is not a fun talk to give. Okay? Um, we're going to end, uh, I'll warn you now, uh, on a hard note and with an image that I'm going to share with you, uh, which is meant to convey what uh, I feel like God wants to convey to us so as to set up what's coming. What we did this morning was the beginning of the good news. The reason why the good news is good news and not just news is because the bad news is horrific. And we don't talk often about the bad news. But the bad news is worse than your worst nightmare. So we're going to look at the second part of the kerygma, which is sin and its consequences. Or why is everything so messed up? Or if I can say this more directly, and I mean every word in it, what the hell happened? The grace to ask for here, odd as this sounds, and I know this sounds odd, the grace is despair. What do I mean by that? Despair is not a virtue. You're not supposed to despair. But the point of reflecting upon all that we're going to reflect on right now is to try to ask the Holy Spirit, mindful that we know Jesus is Lord, and we're going to make that clear by the end of the day, to help us understand that if in fact God had not done for us what he has done for us in the person of his son, you would have no hope at all. That's what I mean by the grace of despair. Okay? It's intentionally supposed to be provocative. It's how God gets my attention. It's how I try to get other people's. So let's take a moment again and just ask the Holy Spirit to come here right now and to move amongst us and to help us to understand what it is that he wants us to understand. So Father, we do ask uh, in your kindness and your love for us that you would uh, very clearly expose the enemy. Father, I ask that you would shine an intense light on the one who seeks to wreak havoc in our lives. The one who hates us. The one who's come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Father, we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus, that you would not only expose how he's working in our lives right now, but that you would Help us to come against him with the authority and the power that you've given to us so that we can grow in freedom and in joy. So come, Spirit of the living God, and move amongst us even now. Help us to hear and see and know those things that you and you alone know we all need to see and know and to hear. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So not too long ago, August 2019, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, that is uh, the order that was founded by St. Ignatius, said this. Symbols are part of reality, and the devil exists as a symbolic reality, not as a personal reality. With all due respect to the Superior General of the Jesuits, uh, I believe he's wrong. And I believe he's wrong based on the words of Jesus. So Jesus, we're going to ask to shine. This is, this is the image that I have in this talk. You ever seen an aircraft landing light? It's like a million candle power. It's an intense spotlight. So God, because God is 
a good God and a loving father, he wants to shine this light on the enemy right now, to expose him, to put him in his place, to help us grow in freedom. This is one of the why, reasons why I ask you to pray for uh, Mary and Steve and myself and Nick and Chris and our work. Um, the enemy can't stand us because we're trying to expose him. Um, but that's all right. We don't mind. Best way I know how to think about what it is we're going to look at is this is game film. Sorry, it's a Packers picture, but um, you can look at them without any... You know, it's like, oh, they're so passe, you know, like they won however long ago. So um, game film, for those of us who like sports and who played sports, uh, is an essential aspect of winning. You study game film because you want to see what your opponent does well and not so well. So when the Chiefs were preparing for the 49ers, there was a lot of tape that was watched. So as to see what they do well so as to be prepared for it and what they don't do so well so that we can exploit it. Took them three and a half quarters to get there, but they got there. It's all right. <laughs> Scripture's game film. Scripture reveals to us, God reveals to us, the opponent, what he does and what he's not very good at. Speaking really honestly from my own life, the humbling thing about just growing older is I've, I've just come to recognize this thing runs the same dang play every single down, and he gets like eight yards every play in my life. But at least I know what his strategy is. So we want to try to do two things. We want to first look at who the enemy is, because this is the overarching answer to the question, what the hell happened? or why everything is so messed up. And then only after that do we want to look at what are the consequences of the fall, which are far worse than I ever really imagined, certainly when I was younger. So first, the enemy. So we want to look at these things. We want to look at his identity, his reason for rebelling, his names, his root strategy. I think he has one. His tactics and his goal for your life. Okay? His identity, his reason for rebelling, his names, his root strategy, his tactics, and his goal for your life. What's his identity? There's only one God, and everything he makes is good. So there's not a good God and a bad God, and they're equal powers, and they're warring. This is not a Marvel comic story, okay? Well, we're just hoping the good God prevails. There's only one God. Satan's not him. He's not a rival to God. He's a creature. He was an angel. His name was Lucifer, which means light bearer. And lots of different traditions and stories down through the history, both in the scriptures and the traditions of the church, have ascribed to him the place which was closest to God's throne. This is an amazingly mighty creature who is majestic beyond anything you and I can fathom. He is not to be trifled with. St. John Paul the Great once said, have nothing to do with the dragon. You don't flirt with dragons. They devour things. So he was an angel. He was a good creature because God only makes good. The Catechism, paragraph 391, Satan was at first a good angel made by God. The devil and the other demons were indeed created naturally good by God. They became evil by their own doing. Genesis 3, which is the story of the fall, right? Which again is inspired poetry. It's game film. Is revealing to us, by the way, not just what happened back then to Adam and Eve. It's also revealing to us what always happens. What the enemy did with them, as we're going to look at when we look at his root strategy, is what he always tries to do with us. It's the heart of every single temptation. But Genesis 3 says the serpent, which is this image, huh? it's a poetic image of the enemy who's going to come to light again in Revelation when we see that the serpent was uh, the great Satan, was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. The point there is just to underline he's a creature. 
Keep him in his place. He hates that. But note what Jesus, who's the eternal son of God, calls this creature. He is, according to Jesus, the ruler of this world. St. Paul calls him the God of this world, or rather the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul calls him the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. St. C.S. Lewis, uh, not St. C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> Might be St. C.S. Lewis, I don't know. I mean, if he's in heaven, he's a saint. We just don't pray to him publicly. But C.S. Lewis once, how many people have read the screw tape letters? Great. If you haven't read, the screw tape letters are an amazing book. They're extraordinarily humbling to read because it's the story of a, a, a senior devil giving advice to a junior devil about how to go after this particular person. And you read this and you go, oh my gosh, like he does this with me all the time. Like, why don't I see this? Anyway, at the, in the uh, foreword of that book, C.S. Lewis writes that the devil's two, um, two lies are either to get us to think that he doesn't exist or to think that he's more powerful than he is. He does exist, Scripture makes that emphatically clear, and so does Jesus, and Jesus isn't culturally bound, but he's not more powerful than God. He is the prince of the power of the air. Why did he rebel? This is the part, please, please catch this. Satan's sin is pride, right? So the angels are pure spirits. They don't have bodies. Our sins are sensual because we have bodies and spirits. The angels are pure spirits. They're just intellects. And the church has always taught that somehow the, the root of the rebellion of the enemy comes from the fact that God had unfurled before all of his creation, all of his angelic creatures, the plan that he had for us, which is to be divinized. And that the plan included that the angels, without losing dignity by any means, would in some sense serve us. Paul says that in one of his letters to the Corinthians, do you not know that you will judge angels? So even though we are on the level of uh, sheer majesty, far lower than the angels right now, in reality, once we're divinized, the angels can't touch us in the sense of majesty. It's extraordinary, quite honestly. This is what provokes the enemy's rebellion. The Book of Wisdom says, through the envy of the devil, death entered the world and those who are in his possession experience it. Who is he envious of? You. This changes everything. See, Satan knows he can't touch God. Satan knows he's a creature. Satan goes to war against the creature God loves the most. That's you. His goal is to deceive you and me so that we will not reach the end for which God has made us because he finds that end abhorrent. Now, why? Why would this majestic angel be so incensed about us. A friend of mine in this uh, paper that he wrote about uh, the Christian life, he says this. This is a great little quote. So he's trying to help us understand how is it this extraordinary being would be possibly envious of you and me, puny as we are in comparison to the angels. He says, he, this is the devil, perceived that in fulfilling the role God had planned for him, according to heaven's logic of love, he would be called upon to serve creatures of far less power and excellence than himself. He envied the good that he saw coming to them. You know what envy is, right? Envy is different than jealousy. It's actually a good thing to be jealous sometimes, right? I see you living a virtuous life. Hopefully that motivates me to want that and I aspire to be virtuous myself. That's jealousy in its best case. Envy is never good. Envy is a sadness that I have over the good fortune of another. And I'm so sad that I don't want them to have it. That's what he is about us. 
So he envied the good that he saw coming to them, and he resented their destined place. The sight of these happy creatures, us, filled the devil and his fallen angels with anger and envy. They took thought as to how they might mar the work of God and destroy the destiny of this newly created race. And then take a picture of this sentence, please, because this is the enemy's desire. They set about to enslave those whom they had been meant to serve and to degrade those who had been assigned such an exalted place into the lowly slime beneath their feet. That's hell's game plan for your life and mine and every human being. Slavery and degradation. We see it played out right now in the world. We have, since the fall, on countless levels. But at the root of what's going on in my life, when it goes wrong, right, when it goes haywire, when I sin, and yours is, don't get me wrong, I'm cooperating, obviously, as we'll get into this, but someone's trying to enslave and degrade me and you. So as one person put it, it's on, on the, the stage, if you will, that is human life. It's not just me and God. And I'm wondering, how come God's got the magnifying glass out and he's just burning me like an ant when things go wrong? No, it's me, it's God, and it's this other creature. Those are the three persons on the stage. His names, his names mean something because his... His names reveal not only who he is, but what he does. Huh? So his names are primarily Satan and the devil. Satan means the accuser. It's what he does. He accuses God. He accuses me. He accuses my friends, my family. I, was, uh, I had a great life growing up in my family. I've, my mom and dad are gone now. They were the greatest people I've ever known in my life. Uh, I have great siblings. Um, they never knew what happened to me in my life, but I was abused when I was a uh, child for quite some time. Satan had a field day with that. His voice in my ear. Where's this good God you believe in? If he's so good, why'd he allow that to happen? Where was he when you cried? Where are these great parents you talk about so often? If they were so great, they would have done something. They didn't do anything. Isn't it obvious they don't love you? Isn't it obvious no one cares about you? Isn't it obvious you're disposable? Isn't it obvious you've been abandoned? Isn't it obvious you don't matter? Simply percentages speaking, there's more than a few of us who had that same experience in this church right now. Regardless if you had that experience or not, we've all had experiences where that voice has spoken to us in different ways. That's what he does. He accuses God. He's not good. His name is also the devil, diabolos in Greek, huh? which means the divider, which is also what he does. So he accuses and he divides he divides us from God, he divides, or he tries, husband from wives, parents from children, priests from priests, parishioners, countries, the world. This is his strategy. It's just to divide. He sows division. His root strategy, and I think there's one, is simply this. God is your adversary not your father. 
certainly not your loving father. This is the lie he tells to our first parents, Adam and Eve, right? God gave Adam and Eve, again, this is inspired poetry, a command that they could eat from any of the trees in the garden. So God provided nothing but bounty for them. They know nothing but perfection, happiness. There's no sickness. There's no pain. There's no objectification. There's no fear. There's no anxiety. There's no death. It's just perfection. And he says to them, you can eat from any of the trees. Don't eat from this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because it's a poetic way of saying if you eat from that tree, what it means is, because when you eat something, you take it, you, you digest it, you break it down, you make it your own. The poetic imagery here is when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you make for yourself the capacity to determine what is good and what is evil. You can't do that. Only God can do that. In other words, you're making yourself to be God. The necessary consequence of making yourself to be God is you cut yourself off from God. And since God is life, if you cut yourself off from life, you die. So the command, don't eat from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, is a gift. Because God doesn't want us to die. It's as if God is saying, in order for you to have life in abundance, you have to trust me, just like any other relationship. Here's the challenge. The enemy that you and I deal with is so powerful and so deceitful and so cunning, he was able to get Adam and Eve, who knew nothing but perfection, to doubt that God could be trusted. John Paul, in a letter that he wrote on uh, the Holy Spirit, says this about who we're dealing with here. God the creator, he's talking about what happened in the fall, is placed in a state of suspicion, indeed of accusation in the mind of the creature. He seeks to falsify good itself, the devil does. For in spite of all the witness of creation, everything that they can experience, which is nothing but goodness, the spirit of darkness is capable of showing God as an enemy of man. Man is challenged to become the adversary of God. And what John Paul goes on to say is, if he was able to do that with Adam and Eve, who knew nothing but perfection, what can he do with somebody who's been sexually abused as a child? Or whose child died? Or whose spouse died? or who's endured all the many hardships that we have here. He tries to capitalize on that like crazy. Why? Because his goal for you and me is to degrade us and enslave us and to keep us from God because in being kept from God, we're kept from life and he hates us. His other root strategy, if you will, is to try to deceive us into thinking that we can find happiness apart from God. Right? This is the temptation of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Obviously, if you just had some of this, if you just ate this, you would be happier than you are now. Just go ahead and have it. And so it is with us in lots of different ways. And the roots of our temptations are either to doubt God's goodness or to think we can accomplish more happiness in our lives without God or at least without God being the Lord of every sphere of our lives. Many of us live our lives like, yeah, Jesus is Lord of this area and this area and this area. This area, not really. Why? Because I'm really not convinced that to surrender that to him is to bring perfect happiness. Might be my time, might be my finances, might be my sexuality, might be my relationships, might be a whole set of different things. Some areas just fall perfectly into place. Other areas we wrestle with much of our lives. Why? Because we're not convinced that to follow God's law, the God who loves us and who made us to be divinized, is to find perfect happiness. What are his tactics? Here's another slide to take a picture of. This is what he does. He accuses. He lies. He divides. He flatters, he tempts, and he discourages, right? So he accuses in all the ways that we said earlier, huh? He accuses God of not being good, of not being there, of not being present, 
of not being loving, of not being merciful. As a confessor, I can tell you I've never seen anything more relentless in a person's life than a man or a woman who's been involved in an abortion. Even in the midst of going through the experience of reconciliation, of hearing God's mercy and forgiveness, the devil has a tenacious hold in someone's life trying to get them to doubt that God could possibly forgive them. He's a liar and he's an accuser. Remember that. God loves to forgive everything. We don't love to forgive. God loves to forgive. But the enemy tries to sow accusations against the enemy. You think God's going to forgive you? You killed your child. You're out of your mind. You knew what you were doing. For those of us for whom that's relevant, Learn to say things like, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm not forgiven. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that God doesn't love me. In the name of Jesus, I bind this accusing spirit and I cast you to the foot of Jesus' cross for him to do with as he wishes. because he's a liar. And we can fight back, as we'll see in the afternoon. He divides. We talked about that. He flatters, right? Flattery is not a good thing. Honoring is a good thing, right? When he got married, he didn't say, I will flatter you all the days of my life. Right? <laughs> At least you shouldn't. Flattery is never good. Flattery is always an attempt for me to say something to you in such a way that I will get something out of it. That's actually what we do do most of the time. Honoring is totally different. Honoring is saying something to somebody in a way to build them up. That is what you promised, right? To honor somebody is to, to like pull out from within them the good that you see in them and to hold it up in front of them. Like, Gerard, you have this in you and it is so good. I just want you to know that I see it in you. That's what you, if you're married, that's what you did promise you would do all the days of your life. It's so important for us to hear people honor us. I remember a priest telling me before I got ordained, John, just remember this. Most people don't think there's anything good in them. We put up these great facades. You know, I got this great exterior. How's life? Fantastic. Wow, you look so good. Yeah, doing well, thanks. But deep down, I got these lurking suspicions because of things I did. They might have been years ago. And I just have no self-worth or I feel like I'm under a spirit of condemnation or accusation. And he said, our task... Our task as priests and our task as human beings, right? It's like the magic coin trick. When you see something in somebody, like pull it out from behind them and go, Tim, you have this? Man, I just want to tell you, I see it in you. It's so good. When we do that, what happens? It's like the person we're talking to stands up. Like, wow. We need to do that for each other. He doesn't do that. He flatters. How does he flatter? He flatters like this. Oh, you know... I know alcohol was a problem for you when you were younger, but you're stronger now. You can handle it. Come on. You're not a kid anymore. You can manage this. And things of that sort. He tries to play on our vanity. Why? Because he wants to enslave and to degrade us. That's why. Of course, he tempts and he discourages, right? Lots of opportunity for discouragement in the world we're living in right now. Lots of opportunity for discouragement in the church we're in right now. But that's his game. Yeah? He tries to take our eyes off the one who made the universe. That's 46 billion light years across. What's his ultimate goal for your life? It's really simple. He wants to destroy you. Priests used to say when they would do missions, the redemptorists especially, like, if we can't scare you out of hell, we'll scare the hell out of you. 
This isn't, this isn't an attempt to, like, to be a scare attack. It, it's an attempt to be sober and realistic. That's what this is. Scripture gives us an account of reality. Reality is about evil and suffering. And ultimately, it's about God's triumph over them. Where do the evil and the suffering come from? At their root, they come from this creature who has unleashed hell into our world. Jesus tells us that he's come to steal and to kill and to destroy. It is, people, very personal. And the enemy has thousands of years of game film on the human race. And he has 54 years of game film on me. And he has however many years of game film on you. And he's constantly playing the tape because that's his goal for my life and yours. So what are the consequences of sin? That's the enemy. What are the consequences of sin? Oftentimes, it's said that the second part of the kerygma huh, is that we would call sin and its consequences. And the consequences of sin are often taught to be this, that you're separated from God. That's very true. Don't get me wrong. But when I was like 23 years old, if you told me the consequences of sin, are you going to be separated from God? I would have met that with a resounding yawn. Like, who cares? I'm separated from God. I'm my own man. I'm just, I'm living the American dream, right? Well, you're not your own man. You're not your own woman. And you're not on your own. If you're separated from God, then it means you're necessarily in the hands of another. There are no independent parties here. So it's not just that. It is that. It's just not that. And one of the most powerful ways that I felt like God showed this to me, so when I was in the seminary, I did the uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. So it's like a 30-day retreat where you're just meditating, you know, for hours in the course of a day in prayer on various moments in Jesus' life. But before you even begin to do that, you spend a week praying on sin and on hell, which is not a really fun week, i got to tell you. And there's one day which is entirely dedicated to hell, and that was one of the worst days of my life. And so in this meditation, I, I felt like God brought me to a place where I was, I was trying to picture what it would be like to, to be in line at the end of the world. So I'm in, it's judgment day. Jesus has come back. It's all over. And I'm in like this massive auditorium. It looks like this maybe. And Jesus is up here standing on a stage and everybody's in line, like all of human history is in line. They're all coming up to him, and I'm the last guy in the line. And I'm seeing him respond to people like, oh, well done. Good and faithful servant. Wait till you see what my father has been preparing for you. And I just see him smile after smile and joy after joy after joy. And then I'm the last one in the line. And his head's down, and he looks up at me, and the smile's gone. And he says to me, the only other thing that we're going to hear, when we die, we're all going to hear one of two things, either well done, good and faithful servant, or what he said to me in this exercise, which was, depart from me. You are cursed. Into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And the sadness was on his face. And then he started to walk away. And I'm there on the stage. And he's walking off the stage. And he's leaving. And he goes through a door. And I hear the door shut. And I'm realizing, he's not coming back. Like there's, no, there's no more time to repent. I can't go find a priest to go to confession. I can't say I'm sorry. Like, it's, it's it. It's over. It's done. And I'm horribly alone. 
And then all of a sudden, I hear this voice start to laugh. And the laughter gets louder and louder and louder. And then this creature walks up to me and says those words. With a look of glee on his face. You fool. God offered you abundant, everlasting life. And you fell for my lie. Wait till you see what I have waiting for you. Here's the reality. When our race fell, when Adam and Eve rebelled, unknowingly, what they did at that moment was they sold our race into slavery to powers that we can't compete against. There are two primary powers we can't compete against. The first is death, and the second is sin, which are both best written with capital letters. These aren't just things that happen. The way scripture speaks about them, they're powers. It's like they're governments or authorities, and they're really easy to prove, I would argue. Someone wrote this once. Have you ever buried someone you love? Because if you haven't, you will. And you will know the sting of death up front and personal. It haunts everything in this life. In two and a half years, I buried my mom, my dad, and my brother. And all of us in here, most of us in here, have buried people that we love. My mom was dying. I was there the afternoon with my sisters. By this point, we lost my dad and my brother. We're standing at her bedside, clearly watching her leave this life. And despite all the resources that my dad had left us behind financially, despite the extraordinary medical care that my mom had, as I'm watching her gasp for air, I am aware of how utterly impotent I am and I can't do a thing to stop from happening what is happening. And if you've been there at the bedside of someone you love, as they're dying, you know it too. Death is a power. Someone said once, We give birth a stride of a grave. The light gleams an instant, and then it's night once more. Death is constantly looking to devour everything. Death is so great, so aggressive, so pervasive, so militant a power that the only fitting way to speak of death is similar to the way one speaks of God. Death is the living power, the presence in this world, which feigns, pretends to be God. Why are we looking at all this? Because this is reality. This is the bad news. St. Paul reminds us, especially in Romans, Paul speaks emphatically about sin and death as powers. We often lose this in the English because there's a variety of different words that are translated there, but the words he's using are the words that stem from the word lordship. Death reigned. Paul says, that is to say, lorded over the human race. It's a tyrant. It's a government, an authority, a power. It exerts control over our race. And you are absolutely powerless from fighting against it. You can't win, right? We hear this all the time with people who've gone through things like cancer. There's a boatload of cancer victims in here. I know that. We hear people say, and I understand what they're saying, right? I'm going to beat this. No, you're not. Not like you can't get well from cancer. You're not going to beat death. You can't. It will claim you. It's the only thing everybody in this church knows is going to happen. That's why it's worth preparing for, right? Right? Someone once said, you know, I love golf. If you, if, 
Great golfers play golf backwards. The rest of us, like, stand at the tee, hit the ball, go try to find it. When you find it, you hit it again, you'll try to find it. You hit it again, you put it on the green, then you get it in the putt, you get to go do that again, right? That's not how great golfers play golf. That's not how Rory McIlroy plays golf. Rory McIlroy plays golf by looking at the green, saying, where do I need to be on the green to make the putt to make a birdie? Then backing up from there and saying, where do I need to be in the fairway to hit my approach shot to be on the green in that spot? And only afterwards to say, then where do I need to hit my tee shot? You play golf backwards. Great people live life backwards. You start by asking the question, when I die, not if, when I die, what do I want to hear? You get two choices, right? Well done, good and faithful servant, which we all want to hear, or depart from me, you accursed, into the fire prepared for the devil and the angels, which nobody wants to hear. Given that, how do I live my life in such a way that I hear this? That's how you live life. Paul, again in Romans, we know that our old self was crucified with him. So he's talking about the effects of what it is that Jesus has done in his passion, which we're going to get to after lunch. So that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. That's a capital S. Sin is not just something that I do or I don't do or I say or I don't say or I think or I don't think. It is those things. But before that, sin's a power. And we are enslaved to it if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. For whoever has died, that is by the effects of what Jesus does for us in his death and resurrection, is free from sin, that is from its power. We'll talk about that in the afternoon. That's great news, people. If we have died with Christ, we believe we also will live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's an extraordinary thing to say. Death doesn't lord it over the, over the Lord. Death's lost its grip. Blessed be Jesus. All men, Jew and Greek, are under the power, St. Paul says, of sin. Paul, again speaking, this is in this letter to the Colossians, about what Jesus has done for us. He has delivered us from the dominion. That Greek word there means, again, the government, the rule, the authority, the power, the lordship of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So when we baptize somebody, cute as this little child is, or not so cute as this little child is, right? Because me, when I was a child, wasn't all that cute. Cute as this little child is, the tragic, sober reality is, if if you could see a spiritual birth certificate or passport, it would say something like this. This child, because it's a child of Adam, is a child of darkness. It has no hope. It belongs to the kingdom of darkness. It's under the dominion of darkness. Everybody, Hence the grace we're praying for right now, to know how utterly hopeless we are if God had not done something for us in Jesus. But he has, so hang on to that, right? But that's the reality. Paul, Romans 7, I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I that do it, It's sin that dwells within me. Why do I put that up there? It's really easy, I think, to prove that death is a power. Everybody here knows you're going to be powerless in front of it. Sin, we might be tempted to go, "Mm, not quite so sure. Here's the proof. Don't raise your hand. Just think for a moment. Anybody in here ever done anything that you didn't want to do? That you hated doing? That you know you shouldn't do? And you did it anyway? Anybody? (laughs) Like all the time? You ever wonder why? Because sin's a power. That's why. And you're powerless against it. This isn't Paul talking here. 
When, when Paul says, I do not understand my own actions, there's no way this is Paul talking about himself. Paul can say about himself, I am blameless according to the law. He's just talked in Romans 6 about how someone who has died with Jesus in baptism is no longer under the power of sin. Who's the I here? The I is the human person left on his own or her own without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the I. That's why we're hopeless without God. Scott Hahn, who I think is coming to the parish here not too long from now. I saw a little flyer out in the narthex, says this, the controlling metaphor of this, sac- of this section that Paul's writing in Romans is slavery and freedom. Paul paints a black or white picture of a human situation. Either one lives in service to sin and remains in spiritual bondage or lives in obedience to God and enjoys liberation from sin's captivity. It's a stark either or. There's no fence sitting. There's no third option. I know this is not how we think. I'm an American for crying out loud. What do you mean I'm a slave to somebody? Here's how another person put it. No one is capable of being captain of his own soul or master of her own fate. Each of us is worked upon by unconscious impulses of which we are not even aware and over which we have little control. Paul, unlike the typical American, does not think in terms of autonomous human beings. No one is free in the domain of this world as it is. Either we must live our lives in the clutches of soul-destroying powers, or we are delivered into the obedience of faith. The clear implication here is that there is no way for the human being to move from the domain of sin to the domain of God's righteousness unless there is an invasion of the kingdom of sin from the outside. In other words, it's not enough to repent. Repentance is important. Asking for forgiveness is important. But it's not enough. I need to be somehow rescued from this kingdom, which we've all become born into because of the rebellion of Adam and Eve. The domain of sin leads to death. Its goal and purpose is death. And there's no way out of this downward moving spiral of dissolution. Remember this quote? Through the envy of the devil, death entered the world. And those who are in his possession experience it. Who is in his possession? Everybody. Unless you're in the possession of God. This isn't meant to scare you. This is just meant to be an account of reality. Here's the best image I know to explain it. Aside from abortion, the greatest scourge in our world right now is probably human trafficking. There are more slaves right now in the world than there have been in the history of the world up until now economic and sexual. It's astounding. And the most powerful way I know how to help people to pray with this, especially women, is to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand how it would be to have been captured and abducted and now enslaved. No one knows where you are, and no one's coming for you. You live in the hands of a fiend who loves to use you, and there's no way out. Ignatius tried to encourage us when we pray to use our imagination to use our senses, our memory. Some of us, when we pray, we see black. Others of us, when we pray, we can see everything we're trying to picture. If you can see things when you try to close your eyes, ask God for the grace. Mindful that the reason we're doing this is because we want to learn how hopeless we would be apart from God. Why? Because we want to grow in gratitude. That's why. It's not so we can feel bad. 
so we can grow in gratitude. Ask the Holy Spirit. We're going to go have lunch in a few minutes. When you come back, take some time and just ask him. Before we get into this next section on rescued, ask him for the grace to picture what it would be like to be in a situation where you are enslaved and utterly hopeless. Whether it's as a victim of human trafficking or whether it's in a prison or a concentration camp or whatever it is, ask the Spirit, take me there so that I can be prepared to give thanks to you for what we are about to talk about next. Jesus, in describing why he's come, says this at one point. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his house, his possessions are safe. Who's the strong man? Satan. What's his house? This world. What are his possessions? Every one of us. There's more to that passage. We'll see it after lunch. Might encourage us, maybe just grab a picture of this slide. I'll leave it up. Although I know Ryan's going to show a little movie, so maybe we'll put it back. Here's why we do this. It's not only to kind of get an understanding of the bad news so as to prepare us for the good news. It's also because God's desire for us right now is to grow in freedom. So it's worth capturing this and then asking the Lord to help give us answers to these questions. Remember, because the Lord is light. The enemy likes to work in darkness and in shadows. God likes to expose shadows because he loves us to grow, walk in freedom. So ask the Holy Spirit, show me right now where the enemy is accusing me. And write it down. Show me what lie is crippling me right now. Show me where he's causing division in my life, my marriage, my family, my work, wherever, right now. Show me where he's flattering my ego right now. Ask him for the grace to identify and to write down what temptation is strongest in my life right now. And finally, ask the Spirit, where am I most discouraged? Here, February 15th, in St. Michael's, right now. Because God wants to free us from whatever the answers to those questions are.